Welcome back to This Week in Finance, the show where you can keep informed, up-to-dated and all of the changes in finance, business, investing and property in the UK. We have quite a few articles to go through to and if you like this video definitely drop one of these as it is much appreciated. Martin Lewis has broken down the changes affecting university students from September. On the current system you repay 9% of everything over £27,295. From the new system it will be 9% over £25,000. So you're effectively paying £207 a year more every year. New students will now have up to 40 years to pay off their loan, which is a 10 year increase from the current repayment period of 30 years. That means that the vast majority will be paying for most of their working lives. While the student loan is technically a debt, he advised to look at it as a tax instead. In this day and age, it's becoming very difficult to actually value the university. For the typical student that's going to a local university that might not be as good for a networking opportunity and is simply going there to party for two years, realize, oh no, I'm getting behind on my studies, to then get a degree that gives them the permissions to work in a cafe. The biggest disadvantage that I've had through not having a degree is basically I have no proof at the moment of continual professional development, meaning that employers might hesitate for a moment when deciding whether to hire me because I don't have any real background of strong commitment to one process or therefore being able to study or educate in my own time. But you're effectively paying such a larger amount of money, a greater tax and for a longer period of time, I don't think that's a great idea. An article on This Is Money says here, watch out investors, fractional shares in an ISA may have to pay capital gains tax after a HMRC shakeup of rules. The taxman claims that the so-called fractional shares, where investors hold slices of shares rather than full ones, are not eligible investments for individual savings accounts. As a result, it could force investors with fractional shares to pay capital gains tax on any profits when they come to sell. Tax experts say the move undermines the government's commitment to opening up investing to everyone, no matter their budget. I completely and wholeheartedly agree with this. It does seem like a backwards approach, especially considering those that are impacted by fractional shares are those that do not have as much to invest. Offering fractional shares is especially beneficial to the smaller investor or saver, and it fits with the ICER objective to encourage investing and saving within the retail markets. Some younger people who invest in fractional shares might stop investing altogether. A spokesman for the HMRC says fractional shares cannot be held in an ISA, while HMRC is fractional threatening action against companies if they do not comply with regulations. Free Trade, my broker, suggests here that they've sought legal advice on the issue and believes the current ISA rules do not prohibit fractional shares from being held in an ISA. We will continue to offer fractional shares until this matter is resolved. Which is very interesting here, so it does seem that there is a rule that goes back to 1988 suggesting that you cannot hold fractional shares. Ultimately, I think it's going to push over, it's going to cool off. There seems to be no logical reason behind the fact that they are stripping away these fractional shares. It very much appears that the legal teams have found one very minor rule and therefore said you cannot do this without actually thought into how they can adapt this rule to current society. 1988 ISA regulations is a long time ago now. We're in the year 2023, just in case you had forgotten by any chance. An article in Alliance News says that UK banks face profit hit from the rising threat of economic hard landing. With the scenario of further rate hikes well into restrictive territory is now on the table. Our house view is that the probability of a hard landing for the UK economy is higher, which showed that UK's stubborn annual inflation rate remained at 8.7%. JP Morgan sees a potential risk to the near-term net interest income due to increased political pressure that may push for banks to pass on the full effects of interest rate changes to their interest rate earning customers. Usually by having a higher interest rate overall, they can get a larger margin here and they can therefore give the customers some but make a greater overall profit. But if politically they are pushed and they likely will be, great to be a consumer, not so great if you're an investor or shareholder of these banks. Following the trending tickers on Yahoo Finance for the week, we can see here that Associated British Foods has seen its sales jump over the last quarter, 13% increase in sales in Primark, while like-for-like -like sales in the same period were up 7 
11%, which was credited to higher average selling prices, meaning that they've increased the price of their products, but they might not necessarily have seen a volume increase. So volumes on a like-for-like -like basis could potentially be down here. So its total sales surged 16% over the three months to the end of May. The troubled cinema chain Cineworld has said that it will file for administration in the UK as part of a restructuring plan that is set to wipe out shareholders, calling in administrators and could release approximately 3.6 billion pounds of its funded indebtedness, a rights offering to raise 629 million pounds and the provision of 1.2 billion pounds in new debt financing a lot of money for a decaying cinema chain. It would not provide any recovery for holders of Cineworld's existing equity interests. Aston Martin has struck an electric vehicle supply deal to create industry leading ultra luxury high performance electric vehicles. That is one hell of a tagline right there. Aston will issue 28.4 million shares shares to Lucid and make cash payments of around £182 million. Lucid will therefore hold a 3.7% stake in Aston Martin. I find this interesting because Aston Martin has gone bankrupt so many times over its history and it's here investing a bunch of electric vehicles which in my mind are a bit of a fad and it's spending £182 million on this remarkably impressive i must say shares in jd sports were trading in the red on tuesday after the fashion retailer shared a trading update the company said that there had been some softening in trade in its north american business in june however it said that this would be offset by the growth in demand for its trainers and sportswear in the uk europe and asia pacific i find this particularly interesting because one of the brands i invest in boohoo has also seen quite some sluggish performance in northern america as well as the rest of the world and i do think there is certainly a trend here that in the united United States at the moment, spending appears to be decreasing on these types of consumer goods. Across the wider JD Sports business, organic sales growth at constant exchange rates moderated to around 8% for May from the 15% growth it reported for the first months of its financial year. Telecom Plus, this is an interesting stock here. The company said revenues soared 155% over the 12 months from last year, rising from 967.4 million pounds to 2.5 billion pounds with profits in that time up 55 percent as well it also said that it's seen a 24 percent increase in the number of services it supplied dividend in this company has gone up to 80 pence a share so if you're an investor of telecom plus you've likely done very well very recently this was a company i was following but never actually bought shares of primarily because i didn't really understand what was going on here but i could easily say with a, a quite a good level of regret here this was probably one that i missed out on walgreens boots alliance slashed its full year profit forecast and announced plans to close 450 stores in the US and the UK. As you have seen, we are accelerating our portfolio optimization to simplify the business. Quite interesting because this is quite a prominent business in the UK named as Boots. So it will be interesting to see how this changes the dynamic of the high street because Boots is one of those almost essential, more staple retailers in most high streets. So it would be interesting to see what kind of competition might slide up through the cracks. Nike reported fourth quarter revenue was which was up 10% year over year and that its Nike direct revenue in the fourth quarter was up 15% year over year but the company wholesale revenue was down 2% year over year. Then even as rivals push ahead on markdowns he said Nike will try and keep its own prices higher saying the priority in the months ahead is will be to drive healthy full priced growth. Barrett Developments appears to be freeing up the balance sheet here after it has made a sale of 604 homes to Citra Living Properties for a cash consideration of £168.4 million. Now it's interesting to note here that Citra is owned by Lloyds Bank. So you can see here that Lloyds is actually investing quite an amount into property. They've got already the UK's largest mortgage book. They could be worth a look here if they are also buying up a lot of rental properties as well as they establish themselves in a dominant market position. WH Smith as well also had an announcement where they're not planning to open any more high street stores saying so that it would risk duplication in many city centers now whms was a share that i used to hold and i do like the growth strategy of the company there's an article that came out and it said here that whms was known as the worst high street store where they are really dominant is actually in the service stations 13 weeks to the end of may total revenue from uk travel locations was up 24 percent on the last year and realistically you can't avoid the price of an eight pound sandwich when you
you going down the motorway. And quite frankly, if I'm going to get rinsed by any business, it's going to be WH Smith. So they're in a good position to dominate in this. Now, HSBC has actually left Canary Wharf for a new world headquarters. The move is part of plans to downsize its office space following the pandemic, as the bank says it's now committed to flexible working. More people are working from home. Businesses are starting to adapt to this. And what's a better idea than businesses to adapt to this? Well, it's to reduce their office space, therefore reduce their overall utilities and overall costs in the investment of the property. I do think being in the office is quite a potent thing and quite important for employee productivity as there are a lot of distractions when working from home. Revolution Beauty has also continued kicking off with Boohoo. It's like two children fighting in the distance and now you're getting sick of it but you can't really tell them off because they're not your children. Quite ridiculous. So there's a good summary in this article here and it goes on about how Boohoo makes a strategic investment in August. Then there's an accounting probe. The shares were suspended and that's where Boohoo then up their stake when they hired the new CEO which is Bob Holt. Then Boohoo planned to oust the Revolution Beauty leadership team and wanted to appoint about three of their own non-executive directors to stage control of the company. Revolution Beauty then says that the Boohoo Coop is opportunistic and self-serving. And then Revolution releases some fantastic Q1 trading results, which claims it's much better placed than the Boohoo candidates to deliver shareholder value. This is in an amazing event. This was the most ridiculous event of the week, I think. The CEO, CFO, and the chairman were fired at the annual general meeting and then they were rehired by the non-executive director the moment the meeting ended. So Boohoo, with all of this power to vote them off of the board, didn't do much. They got rehired at the end of the day. Boohoo therefore airs some serious concerns about the board's conduct, and Revolution Beauty's share scheme is relifted. And then the executives decide to give themselves a bonus if locked up for a period of only 12 months, which Boohoo then says that there's a lack of transparency for hiding terms of share awards, has a go at them for that. And quite amusingly, Boohoo hasn't really got a good track record about that either. Revolution Beauty then goes to focus on Boohoo, and they say here that it could be a part of an attempt by Boohoo to distract its own shareholders from the various issues that Boohoo is facing itself. Then its own recent price devaluation in the past three years, Boohoo's market cap has fallen by over £4.3 billion. Analysts now forecast a net debt position in Feb 24. So as we can see here, despite the recent news with Boohoo and Revolution Beauty, my portfolio is holding well week over week and for the last month it is actually up. However, when we look at a longer term perspective, we can certainly see that my portfolio value has absolutely diminished. And that's because of my large overexposure to Boohoo themselves. That said, Games Workshop is seeing quite a good recovery at the moment, and some of my other positions as well remain in the positive, so there could be some optimistic charms going forward, provided the Boohoo can actually get over this whole Revolution Beauty debacle and start moving on. I hope all of you enjoyed the new format of this video, find it very informing and engaging. I understand that you're very time restricted as people watching this content, so therefore I hope that you prefer it, and if you do, definitely get one of these. Click that subscribe button for more.